everyone, this is Anna Raimondi, and welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. I'm so happy that you're with us. And today, I have one of my favorite guests, Father Nathan Castle. So welcome. It's welcome. great to be back with you. Thanks for having me again. Father Nathan Castle graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio and entered the Dominican order in 1979. He received an MA and a Master's in Divinity from the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley, California. He was director of the Catholic Communities at Sanford University and Arizona State University. He believes the Holy Spirit has given him a night job, isn't that nice, of helping souls who died suddenly and violently to find afterlife peace. It's quite a job. He's the author of En Toto II, The Wizard of Oz as a Spiritual Adventure, and Afterlife Interrupted, Book One and Two, Helping Stuck Souls Cross Over. So welcome again. I'm so happy you're here. Sure. Um, so can you tell us what an interrupted death experience is? Well, I named it that because I wanted it to, in the popular mind to kind of sit next to the near-death experience, which many people are familiar with already. Um, my, my experience is that about 24 years ago, I started having contact dreams where people came in the night and showed me their violent and abrupt violent deaths. And I learned that they needed a little help of moving from one afterlife level to another. Uh, because I'm a member of IONS and was familiar with the near-death experience, I was used to people having some sense of through a tunnel, maybe, or toward a light, maybe seeing loved ones or religious figures and so on. That's what I was used to. And then when this happened, it seemed like that was uh, somehow short-circuited or uh, interrupted. So that's uh, why I coined that phrase. And so would you call them stuck souls? I did in the subtitle of my first book, because that's what it seemed like to me, that they needed something to get them moving again. Um, I, I'm used to working with, with counselees uh, and sometimes with people that have like PTSD. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to rise to the level of PTSD, but a lot of people have some sort of looping thought pattern that they have trouble getting out of and feel stuck in some life situation and that's what it reminded me of that these people needed to think a fresh thought see something from a different point of view but then i learned over time that not all of the people that come to me had that issue. many did but some just because of the the violent and suddenness of their death they just needed more care uh, in the afterlife than maybe someone who had died peacefully in their sleep and so how do you provide that to them uh, one by one, you know, kind of case by case, but they, they come and I, and show me something almost always it's their end of life scene. Not always. Sometimes people will have a tragedy that happens to them in the middle of their life where they feel like they died inside, but they kept going mm -hmm. once in a while. I get something like that. Uh, but most, what, what happens is I receive a dream. I write it down in a journal. Uh, I, I schedule time with prayer partner or prayer partners. Uh, I try not to keep people waiting more than about a month at all. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a busy guy and so are my prayer partners and they don't seem to mind. Um, they're, they're quite patient. But when we do get together, we go into protected prayer with uh, Michael the Archangel, Holy Mary, a bunch of the, the saints and angels. And then um, I just allow them to speak through me to one of my prayer partners. Uh, and uh, we get acquainted, we hear, they're all vetted, the people that come to us are ready to move along, and it's very orderly, so no one needs a lot of persuasion. I compare us to the discharge staff in a medical facility, somebody, usually a social worker or someone like that, who, who talks with you on the day of your release about your meds, your next appointment, make sure that you've got a ride, you'll, you'll be well fed, that sort of thing. Do you speak to them more than once? Not normally. So you provide counseling? 
yes. Um, although it's been preceded by a lot of other counseling. You know, I'm a Catholic priest. And one of the things that Jesus told his followers, his disciples, was that um, others, he, he once said, others have sowed the seed and you have come into the harvest. You know, I'm on the back end of, a, of the work of a lot of other people in the afterlife. And uh, by the time they come to me, they just need a little simple help, maybe finishing touches of what other people have helped them do. So you feel that the Holy Spirit um, brought this to you. How does, did. how does the Catholic community feel about that? I've been well supported. Uh, I'm a Dominican and I you know, live a vow of obedience to my superiors and we elect our superiors. And since I came out with the first of these books in 2019 and went public with this work, um, one went out of office and another was elected and both of them have endorsed my books and my work. They, they know me and they trust me and I'm only telling the truth. I think that's wonderful. I talk about you all the time to people. Do you? Uh, yeah, because you give such, um, you're, you're fresh and you give validity to something that many people have known for a long time, but been told you can't believe in this. So I think that, you know, what you're doing kind of brings it to the life and to show that there is an afterlife. That's the critical thing to me for Christian people Easter is our biggest day of the year, and it's Jesus has risen from the dead. We're not just happy for him, we're happy for all of humanity because he's showing us what we are, that we are, we are not only mortal, we are at the same time eternal and um, or immortal. And that's the, the pro Easter proclamation is what it's called. It's the church's essential message. So I feel like I'm right in the heart of exactly why the church exists and in, in proclaiming this work in this unusual way. As a Catholic, you know, I thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, sure. So you talk about different levels in the afterlife. So what are these levels? Well, I'd like your uh, audience to know that I haven't been given a guided tour of the afterlife. It's not like I'm an expert in everything afterlife, but I have seen this one little portal uh, I, I feel like I'm at my post. And so if you have a job where you work in one aspect of a, a factory or assembly line or office, I'm very familiar with the surroundings right where I work. And it involves the, uh, some sort of sense of a afterlife ceiling that you rise to a certain level and you no longer need what is supplied here and you're ready for more but there needs to be a transition from one level to the next. You're told that you can come back and visit. You're not leaving behind something forever. It's just that uh, it reminds me of moving from second grade to third grade. You already learned everything that second graders need to know. It's time to go on, spread your wings, learn some new things. So people who have had NDEs talk about seeing the light. So these souls that come to you, have they seen the light? which is God. They see lots of different things. One of the things I've learned is, I think I already knew how important imagination is. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you can either dread the day because you imagine it being awful or uh, maybe the weather out the window is, is bad. Or what, you can, what you imagine, you, you, we really create our futures and when people die with a certain kind of imagination, they they sort of craft their surroundings. Uh, at least that's what I've seen. And some of them, um, well, some of them just needed to fall asleep because it was so overwhelming. And we often pray that at funerals and have that RIP on tombstones. Mm -hmm. We want people to rest in peace, but the whole point of resting is getting refreshed and renewed and rising. Um, so sometimes people just need rest. Other times they they isolate because um, they're frightened. And so they create some sort of, I don't know, just drab place where they're left alone. Um, a lot of them find they wake up in something like a, a really well-functioning high-end clinic where 
everybody's attentive and everything works where everything they try on you, they're not experimenting. <laughs> everything that they suggest that's for your health help, makes you healthier. I've seen that a lot. So do they feel the, the energy of God, whether or not they believe in God? They do. They don't always call it that. Um, and most religious systems have some way of both identifying a deity and at the same time, understanding that God is everywhere and that the energy of God can be focused on something like a throne room or a tabernacle or some fixed point. But then we also understand if God is everywhere, all of God is everywhere. God's not divided into parts, mm -hmm. um, that all of God is present all, always in everyone. I, I had a, a minister that died, a, a Christian minister that died and who for a long while was cared for by kind people. But at one point he said, when am I gonna see Jesus? And they said, well, don't you remember that the Holy Spirit, that, that after he rose, his spirit entered into all of his followers. You've been seeing him all along. It's just that he looks like us. Oh my God, that gave me chills. That's so beautiful. Well, they also said, but if you wanna see him with a toga and sandals and a beard, we'll get you ready for that. So what about the white light that all these people are seeing when they have NDEs? That seems to be a constant with NDEs. What is the white light then? You know? Well, it's not, it, it's not my experience in the work that I do. They don't talk about having seen a white light necessarily. They, they all have a great variety of what they, where they lived and what they saw. So, you know, uh, many hospice nurses will talk about, um, and I mean, I know that, you know, when my father passed, you know, he talked about seeing his mother. Um, do they ever talk to you about who they saw before they passed, who led them through? Often it's their guardian angel. Uh, and I frequently ask for the guardian to, to speak first, just to supply some clarity, because you know how dreams are. They always are uh, subject to some sort of interpretation. And I want to make sure that I'm getting as much clarity as I can so that we don't go stumbling into the work we're doing. For example, if I'm not absolutely sure if the person's gender, uh, someone will show themselves as the driver of a vehicle that runs off the road. But a driver isn't necessarily male or female unless they show me that they were male or female. Sometimes they'll show me, I get a sense of age, 40 something or younger or older. Uh, sometimes nationality, I'll have a sense that I'm not in the United States and that I'm somewhere else. So I'll often ask the guardian, could you give us a little clarity um, as we get used to or move into helping this person? And that also operates as a kind of a mic check. It shows this person who's never come in and spoken through somebody else's voice before that it's really simple and uh, and it not and it nothing to be afraid of. So, how much of this is you seeing, feeling, um, and hearing? Do you does it happen in every way to you? Well, the the dream, of course, um, it has visual uh, dreamscape imagery. So, of course, it's with it's eyes closed in the dark when I'm asleep, but it but it's still uh, it's it's visual interiorly. Often, oftentimes there's sound. Sometimes they'll want to say a phrase or a word and I'll hear that. Oftentimes it's um, tactile or intuitive, the way that you feel like somebody is in the room with you, but you didn't necessarily hear, taste, smell, be here. You have a, a, a sixth sense, if you will. Sometimes it's that. So they're coming to you. Are they also coming to their own loved ones? here on earth? Sometimes they've done a little bit of that. Sometimes um, they have made an effort to, for example, attend their funeral. Um, often these trauma, traumatized souls that I deal with find that uh, too overwhelming. It's too soon or it it's too, makes them too sad or, or guilty or something. Um, most uh, most of them have not spoken much about trying to reach other loved ones. Do some of them stay stuck 
even after you've worked with them? Not that I'm aware of. So, Again, they're vetted. So they're not even, they, they talk about getting in my line, you know, like there's already a few waiting ahead and they'll, they'll some help, they'll talk about having been given options that this wasn't, they needed to make some sort of crossing. One lady, she compared it to catalog shopping. She had died in the fifties and used to have the Sears and JC Penney catalogs. And she said, they handed me something like a catalog. And when I saw this priest was one of the options, I said, I'd like that one because I was a Catholic. Others have compared it to travel agencies where there's all kinds of brochures, or you know how sometimes off to the side in a hotel lobby, if you're not busy engaging the clerk, you might be fiddling around with brochures about a steam train or a botanical garden or some, some thing that you might do while you're in town. They, they have some sort of options put in front of them in attractive ways, and sometimes I'm chosen. Do they, and they never get back to you saying, hey, I'm okay, I'm in the next- The only week. time we, uh, when, when I tell any of their stories in public, as in a book, or in both of these books, uh, I never do that without asking their permission. And I don't think it's appropriate to ask their permission in the middle of their crossing. They're already busy and it's not time for me to be talking about a book. Um, but I'll go back to them in prayer later on with a partner and not try to engage them for our amusement, but just ask a simple yes or no question. May we use your story? Often those end up being uh, visits where they give a little update on what they've been doing since the last time we were together. Oh, can just you just the way that example? friends talk to each other? You can know? you give us an example of that? Oh uh, yeah, the book has 26 examples. Each one of them has 13 stories and each one of them has, um, one of them involved a woman who at 24 had a, an automobile accident that caused her to be paralyzed from the waist down. She was never out of a wheelchair ever again. Uh, the dial-a-ride driver dropped her on the ground and she died 12 years later at 36. And she told us that, uh, for a long while after her crossing, she did nothing but cartwheels. She oh, just, nice. she loved moving. And she said, it's, I, I know it sounds silly with all the things that a person could do in the afterlife, but it's not like I'm wasting time and nobody's saying, you get back in here and do your dish, do these dishes. <laughs> she said, I'm just happy to be able to move. And for a while, that's all I want, all I want to do. I'm sure I'll get tired of it at some point, but right now I just do cartwheels. And just to clarify something, if somebody has a handicap or someone has PTSD, they don't necessarily become stuck. Oh, no. And people that die violently don't necessarily become stuck. I, I try to underscore that. I'm glad you brought it up in this, this uh, conversation. But in, my, in both of my books, I make that point. Don't think that just because your loved one died suddenly that they're stuck. I think it's very rare. How did the angels get involved in all of this with you? Or with well, them? I've had a relation with my own guardian since childhood and St. Michael the Archangel for a long time. So they're just old friends. And that's, I knew that everybody arrives here with a guardian and that even if it appears that people die alone, it's really not true. They die at least in the presence of their guardian. And even if they were not a believer in the afterlife or a believer in angels, they come around to the knowledge. It's just plain to them that, well, uh, it, it turned out to be true after all, here I am. I know that I died and I'm still going. And this other guy, I didn't know he was an angel, but uh, eventually, you know, he helped me or he, even if I, even those who isolated their guardian won't leave them alone, they'll just go to the edge of whatever the construct is whatever the person has created for themselves their guardian will go sit over there in the corner and watch so do do the souls have a choice in who escorts them over can they say i want my angels or i want my father and they do both of those sometimes they say well my guardian's already here i don't feel the need to call on anybody else uh, i when i was first at this i would often have my prayer partners ask this question at a key moment can you think of anyone who died before you did who you know loved you? 
what I wanted to do was mostly calm people down because they, this little population has been traumatized. So I felt it was really important to ask a calming question like, Anna, do you, who do you know that, you, that loves you that died before you did? And uh, oftentimes that works. Sometimes they choose uh, celebrities out of the blue because it's kind of like, you know, if it could be anybody, it's like that game of who would you like to be for, with on a desert island? You know, you could be with anybody, who would it be? Sometimes that happens. So they could pick um, like Frank Sinatra. He'd have to be willing and, av and available. Uh, that hasn't happened, but that is, doesn't that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. A lot of celebrities here take advantage of their notoriety by supporting charitable causes and doing philanthropic things. And some of them are continuing to be at the service of other people. And sometimes it, it makes people who feel um, unimportant or their life was cut off or they feel guilty about the way they died. Sometimes it gives them a boost to their esteem that somebody as important as you cares about me. It makes them kind of take another look at themselves as maybe more important than they thought they were. Have you heard about this in your work where a certain celebrity will come through? Oh someone? yeah, it, 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 it happens frequently enough that I'm not surprised by it anymore. Although I suppose I still am. It's, it's still delightful when some, some celebrity shows up to help. Um, Can and, you share what celebrities have come through? Yeah, the ones in the book, uh, one, one young man who died uh, before beginning a PhD program wanted uh, Albert Einstein. And he didn't hang around a long time. He just showed up and he showed up as like a 30 year old professor just starting out. He wasn't that wild shock of old, you know, old man with that white hair that we think of. Uh, he was a tweedy young professor. He showed up as his young self to kind of be an older brother to this fellow who was about six years younger. Uh, he so showed up. Would you say the souls on they can like be in more than one place, like they're multidimensional, can be in more than one place at the same time? Well, I've always believed that because, uh, for example, I went to a church named after Mary and how many of those are there in the world? <laughs> She's, she can be all over the place and listening to lots of prayers at the same time. So as a child, I understood that that was something that was possible in the future for, and Mary is not a divinity in our understanding. She's a human person. Um, infused with the divine like we all are but uh but fully human but there there she is showing up all over the place and uh there's something about about god's love that makes us indivisible we don't have to split up into little parts to go here and there we can somehow be fully present in more than one place at a time i think that's a skill that has to be learned i don't think you will necessarily know how to do that on day one after right. your death right. but if you're if you're uh if you choose that you could start learning that pretty soon this seems all very serious is there any funny moments or humor involved in all of this all the time um this is not in either of the books but um uh, this past summer i i had a seven week uh vacation it, covid has changed everything and so as long as i've got my computer and my my uh, I take my work wherever I go. So I was with my best friend who's a retired priest. We uh, had rented an Airbnb. He did. I went along for the ride. Uh, and we were both baseball fans watching my, I'm a Houston Astros fan. He's a Boston Red Sox fan. And most, you know, baseball plays, they play about six days a week. So we each had our, he had an iPad. I had my laptop. We're watching our games and the Little League World Series was on at the same time. And we were watching that on a flat screen on the wall, on a big screen. And I was doing, I was doing a crossing and this guardian angel said, um, we seem to have come at a time when the line is moving very rapidly because I had the leisure to work with, to, to do more of this and, and was getting, giving them faster service. He said, we've seemed to have come at a time when the line is moving rapidly. We've been, we've been told we don't need to go anywhere. We can stay here and, and wait our turn. And he said, um, we asked him who, what his name was, and he said, I would like you to call me Jake, but not from State Farm. <laughs> that made you laugh. You wondered if it was funny. 
I would like you to call me Jake, but not from State Farm. Yeah. And and, all the time, they have a sense of humor. Well, he went on to explain why Jake from State Farm. He said, I have been here with these men uh, and the dog. And he said, um, uh, they watch baseball on two small screens and one large one almost every day. And he said they watch adults play on the small screen and they watch children play on the large one that was Little League World Series. And he said, but whether they're watching the small screens, the adults, or the big screen, the children, the baseball is interrupted at regular intervals by Jake from State Farm. <laughs> now, <laughs> and then he went on to explain, now Jake is, uh, everyone he encounters is under the misapprehension that they are getting a special deal from him. And he must disabuse them of this understanding. Um, and tell them that no, everyone gets this rate and that's why they should buy this product. So anyway, he went on to explain the whole rationale <laughs> of Jake from State Farm. That's funny. It was funny, I, I still left thinking Offer about it. Any advice to the living so that they don't get stuck? Live in the present moment, you know, do the best you can not to grind over past sadnesses if you really feel guilty about something, sit down and, and figure out what's real and what's not real, because we can feel guilty of, about stupidities. We can feel guilty for uh, all kinds of things that were not our fault. Um, discern what, what if there's something that you really did wrong, apologize for it, make amends, turn the page, live in the present. Same thing with the future. There's all kinds of things to worry about if you're inclined to worry. Um, Take note of anything that you might be able to do to affect a better future, but stay in the present. I think that's really, really good advice. Yeah, it is, it may be. And, but, and then it's easier said than done. I know very well because I have to do it just like everybody else. Like everybody else. Um, but one of the ways to stay in the present is to be of service to other people. You know, when you're, when you're doing something positive for someone else, you're probably not worrying and you're probably not fretting about the past. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, service, practical service to someone is always a good tonic. Have you ever worked with someone who was absolutely horrible, like a murderer? Um, have I worked with someone who committed a murder? Yes. Have I worked with someone horrible that would be a judgment I wouldn't feel the need to make because I. Um, like somebody would, went into a grocery short store and just shot the guy at the register because he needed money, like senseless, not like a crime of passion or anything like that. I haven't had that. I've had people that died in, um, in these shootings that involve a lot of people. Um, I've had that. And I have had people that took the life of another person, but they wouldn't be in my line until they were fully repentant and clear on what yeah, caused really them to make that choice and so on. I'm never made to be unsafe. I'm never in the company of people that would harm me or, or my prayer partners, although we always pray for protection before we enter into mm -hmm. that, that realm. How have these experiences changed you? I'd like to say it made me into a completely non-judgmental person. Wouldn't you like to be a completely non-judgmental person? Yeah, I think that the, whenever you're working with those um, in the afterlife, you, you have to sit in that place of non-judgment. Um, well, just just in my day-to-day -day life, it's it's made it more important to me to try to not have opinions about persons and things where I could just as easily mm -hmm. let things be, you know? I don't, I don't need to have a, a thumbs up, thumbs down about just everything that crosses my path. And in fact, part of the national, maybe international malaise that I think we're in is because so many people are being too harsh with each other. Oh yeah. You know? And could we just have a holiday from feeling the need to be superior or uh, be angry or whatever. So I, I've seen that a lot of people who were used to being judged crossed over 
and found that before long, they realized that nobody's judging me and that found that delightful. Well, it is delightful not having to live up to anybody else's standard. Yes, and what I remember one was a suicide and she, um, she entered into the afterlife with a sense of shame or some sort of foreboding that someone would lower the boom on her for having taken her life. And she was told, um, a this is in book two, well, none of us have been where you were and went through what you went through. It's not our place to have an opinion. We're simply here with you now, and we're here to help you now. That's pretty wonderful. Yeah. What do you think the future holds for you as you go more and more public? It's interesting in that uh, uh, you and I are both in lives that are kind of entrepreneurial, wouldn't you say? Having a podcast. Um, so. And a lot of people are or a lot of people are working from home and having maybe some sort of side hustle where they're having to learn how to do a lot of stuff with mm -hmm. websites and podcasts and technologies and complexities. This week, I'm in the process of potentially hiring an assistant for the first time because I just can't keep up with all of the oh, that's great. demands on my time. Uh, I've had an assistant doing uh, just tech, just uh, computer and tech stuff, but now I really need somebody to just help me handle the uh, flow of all the things that I'm that are coming my way. So that's that's big for me. Are you speaking about this at all? Whether on Zoom? I mean, I know because of in COVID, nobody's really on. Like, yeah, there, um, are you familiar with an organization called Spiritual Awakenings International? Mm -hmm, I am. I'm, uh, I've been given a keynote at their June uh, conference, which will be on Zoom, and that's their model. Because they're international, they want to make their uh, Zoom meeting the norm even after the pandemic is over. Um, and maybe they'll have a secondary opportunity to come together in a hotel, but it'll, it'll kind of flip the model. Most conferences are really based around in-person presence at a conference center. Mm -hmm. And then secondarily, they record things. But this organization is doing it the other way around. And then I have another speaking engagement. They're all, they're all so far uh, Zoom. But I, I'm addition, I have a, a YouTube channel that your, your uh, audience might like to know about. It's just my name, Father Nathan Castle on YouTube. And I've been doing a lot of um, Bible study um, for people that never really, that that are not churchy people, because mm -hmm. you, that's something that you would think of going to church to do, but you don't need to be churchy in order to study any of these things. And so I've, I've made, I've done those on Zoom and posted them to my website. People might enjoy that. And they don't have to, uh, it can all, you can leave the room so easily on Zoom. <laughs> you don't have to feel like you're, uh, you know, you, everybody's watching. You can watch something for a little while and then turn it off if you don't like it. But I've been I've been doing a lot of uh, a video, so my, and all of that's on my YouTube channel. Oh, that's wonderful! And do you do any videos talking about um, your books or what's written Lots in your books? Lots of them. For example, this uh, this interview will will post to my YouTube channel with your permission. Oh, um, absolutely. And so a lot of people learn of me through these, and then I've been on some podcasts with very wide um, audiences. Some of them get like twelve thousand views. So. When I go, go on any of these podcasts with really large audiences, as you might expect, I get a lot of email afterwards and then do a fair amount of consult work. I tell people I'm kind of like the tow truck driver. I, if you feel stuck, I'll, I'll, I'll spend one Zoom session with you pulling you out of the ditch, but I won't follow you down the road. <laughs> I'm, I just can't do ongoing counseling with all kinds of people, but I can give them oh. one, uh, one conversation where That's I can nice. and suggest something. Yeah, you're only one person. Um, you know, your work is so needed. You know, from those on the other side and from people on this side to hear about it. There are a lot of people that have disengaged with the religion of their childhood or their upbringing. And sometimes they're circling back around after having found other alternative ways of seeing the world and so on. And sometimes they 
they don't want to have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. There might have been something good in the, the Christianity of their childhood, whether Catholic or Protestant. Uh, and I can sometimes help them sort that out. Um, what is it that has some staying power that you believe to be true? If there are some things that you needed to transcend, go past or uh, downplay, what are those things? I can help people kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of organize. You know how there's some people that just have a careers as, as organizers? Mm -hmm. I'm into your kitchen or your garage and mm -hmm. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good at that. I can help people sort and say, well, what do you believe to be true? Because I, I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. But whether you ever believe in him by name or not is your business. But I can help you uh, work some at what you believe to be true and what's not true. Yeah, I tell my clients, you know, don't get caught up in the language and the rhetoric. And also, it's a buffet. Pick and choose what works for you. Not everything's going to work. Well, there's a... a uh, there's a phrase in the Catholic Church that is usually used unkindly, being uh, which is to call another person a cafeteria Catholic, yes. and that suggests it, it, it suggests a negative judgment that you're either all in or you're not, and it's not fair or right to pick and choose. On the other hand, I say, well, who goes to a cafeteria and eats everything in the line? It, it's a lot of it's not good for you. It's, first thing I smell when I go into a cafeteria is the fried chicken. I could just load up on that and be, be a happy guy, but it's not good for my body. Um, so there's a certain amount of picking and choosing that I think is uh, the reality in the lives of real people. You are such a breath of fresh air in a world that sometimes feels like it's coming apart. And well, I really do thank you for all that you do and all that you bring to people. If it did come apart, it'll still be okay. God, God is still God and God's not coming right. apart. It's and God's not gonna stop loving you if the world comes to an end. <laughs> God, God is God is, and is with you and loves you. And anything that you and I can do to help make that clear to people is um, part of the day well spent. Yeah. And people need to hear that, you know, instead of going into, you know, I hear people all the time, they're so depressed about, what's happening with COVID and what's happening with the government, you know. Oh, and don't forget global warming, dear. <laughs> and global warming, <laughs> yeah, all those things. Um, and you bring this, you know, this this beautiful warmth and light to, to all of us. And again, thank you. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. Truly, you're one of my favorite guests. Thanks. I didn't tell you when you asked earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to podcast. I'm hoping to launch my own in the next few months. Oh, well, that'll be nice. And you'll be able yeah. to reach more people. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's one step at a time. You Absolutely. Know? And God brings it to you when you're ready for it. That's how and my, everything. I'm partly ready for it because of COVID. I don't have the full calendar with all the travel that I used to do. Yeah. So and I have the leisure to sit here and figure out how to be a podcaster and well, there's always it. a yin and a yang, and, and COVID yeah. has had its positives as well as its negatives, but it has had its positives. It has. So, well, thank you again, and thank you all of you who have listened today. You can always listen to my podcast, Talking to the Dead in Suburbia, on YouTube or on SoundCloud, whatever you'd like. Um, we thank you. Father Nathan for being here. And again, he has his own YouTube channel. You can listen to that as well. God bless you all. And can I get my uh, my website title in there oh, too? Sure. I'm sorry. That's all right. It's uh, my name, Nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N dash castle.com. I prefer to be contacted through the email that is on the website. I'm not really good with all the other ways that people can contact you, mess, Facebook Messenger and all these other things. If you want a prompt reply out of me, email me. That's, that's, uh, I'm very responsive to that. And absolutely pick up his books. They're, they're wonderful. That's yeah, they're available on found, Amazon. And that's how I found you. I read your book. And they're all, saying, uh, they're all in book form. Book they're paper the books, they're ebooks, and they're also audio books because a lot of people like to do that when they're jogging yes. or commuting or so, whatever. You can find that on Amazon, and I highly suggest no matter how you want to read it or listen to it, um, you can do that. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Okay, God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.